Kelly, come on up. That is a huge wall of fire coming towards us. Sometimes we engage the fire and we're anchored in, you know, and we start with what the situational awareness that we have and things change and we have to disengage and maybe we do point protection around a community or maybe we, we disengage due to fire behavior and the fire's got to get bigger right now before we can engage safely. Let's go to the safety zone, guys. Let's go. Grab, get in the trucks. Balancing risk versus gain sounds easy, but it's much more complicated than that. You're taking a certain percentage of risk when you get up and drive your vehicle to work every day. And so just to say we're not going to risk the lives or the safety of our firefighters to put out a fire is impossible to say. We, we've already put them at risk as soon as we put them in the truck and put them on the highway. As one of the leading fire agencies, not only in the United States but in the world, are we doing it the right way or is there some other thing that we should be looking at? Everybody in that event, I'm convinced, was doing the best they could. And they, and what they did made sense to them at the time. Stay safe, keep focused, and please everybody come home. When you look at the uh, Forest Service Strategic Plan, which has been set out in 2015 to 2020, there's four primary goals. Those strategic goals include sustaining our nation's forests and grasslands, delivering benefits to the public, applying knowledge globally, and the last strategic goal is to excel as a high-performing agency. One of the objectives includes wildfire. That objective is mitigating wildfire risk. Looking good, Boise. Usually when we get our initial briefing, the division or the branch will basically make a picture for us so that we have an idea of what is out there. If there are structures out there, if there's power lines out there, you know, if there's public out there, if we're, you know, we have a trail system that we have to deal with or something like that. So that way we have those things that we may have to go out and mitigate and try to keep those from being threatened. When we pull up on initial attack, usually it's a going fire. We're trying to gain as much situational awareness as we can. And with that, the first thing we want is communications with folks that we're working with and aviation resources, basically, so we can communicate. During the initial attack size up, I'm either in communications with an incident commander responding to the scene or um, some sort of aircraft. They're feeding me information, which in turn, I'm evaluating and sending to the line officer. When I'm acting in the IC3 role, an emerging incident usually, a small fire is getting big or threatening something critical. As I approach that fire, I'm thinking about several things, obviously thinking about safety, and risk management is a big deal. Biggest, biggest gain for the least amount of risk is what we're always trying to accomplish. One of the strategies is to respond to fires based on a protocol for managing risk leading to a safe, efficient, and effective use of firefighters and other assets. In the Chief's letter this year, he has the expectation for us to have dialogue around risk. And a part of that is his desire for us to really focus on a conversation between line officers and fire folks regarding risk. The first thing that comes to mind is direct attack. Anchor, flank, and pinch. Establishing the LCS. Then if those aren't working and the fire is moving too fast or getting bigger or just have too many hazards out there, then we'll start backing off and looking at alternate fire line. Copy that. It's a little hot over here. So now I'd have guys scouting out ahead to see what the, what's out ahead of the fire, if this is the best tactic that we're using. We'll have folks working with adjoining resources to make sure we're all on the same page and just gaining more situational awareness as we get more committed to the initial attack. If it's a situation where we don't know all the information or we're not too sure about, we'll scout it out. I'll tell them, uh, we'll go look at it and we'll come up with, you know, if that's viable or if it's too hazardous for us to get in there. Perhaps a more difficult 
uh, decision even then whether to suppress or not suppress comes in after you've made the decision to suppress a fire and then realize partway through that it's not working for you. And so then you've got to decide now what. A lot goes into that decision. And when we want to talk about risk versus reward, if what we're doing is not working, then we're definitely putting people at risk without benefit. And that's got to be stopped. So, as you're going to be so what I'm asking you is to evaluate your actions. We know you're mitigating the risks. We know you're mitigating hazards. But are the actions that you're actually taking worth the exposure and worth that risk? I'm trying to get everybody on the same page so they understand the hazards that are out there or if there's no way of mitigating them and then we have to back off, then we'll just back off. Nobody wants to lose a fire. Nobody wants to hand off a fire to another IC or an incident management team. And we have a tendency to order more. Order more firefighters, order more fire engines, order more aircraft. When we know that no matter what we order, we're not gonna catch this fire. It's okay to slow down and let that fire do what it's gonna do, get people out of harm's way, keep firefighters out of harm's way, order that higher level management that you need that can come in with an organized structure to provide order, to provide a written plan, to develop a strategy and tactics with the right mix of resources to deal with that situation. As that fire is progressing, we constantly reevaluate what the needs are on the ground, and that's talking directly from a duty officer standpoint to the incident commander and then um, back to the line officer. And it's kind of a risk management. What values are out there? And then what, what is it going to take to suppress that? If you're having a dialogue with the line officer and gaining an understanding of a risk, you're building that relationship about trust and understanding that when you are in a situation, an emergency situation, when you have a fire going, that you have built up an understanding of what you're considering. And that thought process about risk and the actual deliberate dialogue about it really kind of focuses it in your head. What it's really doing is creating that understanding between the line officer and the field going folks about what it is that you're really considering. Hey, I just check in, pump still running, correct? Communication is key for everything. We hear it in every part of our aspect and it's no different uh, in, in wildfire and fighting fire. Everyone has to be on board. Everyone has to know that tactics and strategies are changing. And the same can be said when you transition tactics and strategies or decide to disengage from a fire. Everyone has to know what you're doing and, and some understanding of why you're doing it and get buy off in that. When the IC and his staff are able to really paint a picture for the line officer, we go through a great dialogue about talking about risk. And when we dialogue about it, we really come up with some good solutions. And to me, those discussions have really led to some great outcomes of not going there. And that's the benefit of the discussion. When you review the Lessons Learned website and you look at tragedy fires that have occurred over the past several years, there's a common theme. Oftentimes, the leading contributing factors to those firefighter fatalities are based on the decisions that individuals or module leaders or incident commanders made on their own. If you're not comfortable engaging the fire, there's probably a good reason for it. And I feel like we have support, especially on this forest. If you don't feel comfortable, nobody's ever gonna get in trouble for engaging when they don't feel comfortable. The question is how much risk and how much gain and that's where the IC3 has to have that conversation with the duty officer and with the forest supervisor potentially and really discuss what are the risks. Are they exceptionally high? What are the rewards? Take a moment to pause and really look at the whole situation at a higher level and ask yourself, is this the right place? Is this the right time to engage this fire? Engage in conversation with your peers. Collectively build your plan with the team of folks that are around you. Don't feel that you have to make these decisions by yourself. So the communication, I think, working for us up to the ops folks and then the ops folks working with the ICs and, it, and with the line officers, 
of whoever's ground it is that we're working on. That's the key back and forth discussions that are being, are, that do take place and, and need to continue to take place. As an IC, one of the things I have to remember is that I'm working for a duty officer, a line officer, and it takes a lot of communication between the field and that duty officer and the line officer to make sure we're all on the same page. I have to paint a good picture for them of what I'm really looking at. It's really hard when you're sitting in an office with a, a map in front of you to understand really what's going on out there. And so that's my responsibility as the IC, as the eyes on the ground, to paint that picture for them. I feel like uh, our relationship with lying in regards to risk management is as good as it's ever been. Both ways, the uh, communication flows up and down well. I know they want to do more. We've had conversations about that at a national level, the Hot Shot Steering Committee has, and at a regional level. Everything from initial attack to long duration fires. Oftentimes when we think about uh, communications, we think about the communications of, between firefighters, between modules. But an important part of communications is how can we communicate as firefighters to our line officers? I would ask that you use your duty officers to help you with that. Keep your duty officers informed at the district level or the forest level. Keep them informed of the situation. Paint the picture so that way we can brief the line officers and our agency administrators about the actions that you're taking. The communication between the IC and the duty officer, um, that, that's an area where you have to have an open line of communication. The situation on the ground uh, from an IC perspective, they have one picture. From the duty officer's perspective, they have a broader, more of an umbrella picture of what's going on and what resources are being used on other fires and what the priority is. This summer, you may see more engagement from your duty officer. What we're looking for is to have a conversation to talk about your strategies and your tactics that you're implementing and really bouncing ideas off of each other and thinking about what are the other things that we're missing. On this forest, uh, I feel we get a lot of support from our duty officers and our line officers up and down the ladder, and that's very appreciated as an IC. When you express concerns or just want to explain why you're doing what you're doing and that it will work, that they're actually listening to you, that they'll take that advice. If we understand each other about what I'm assuming risk for and what you're assuming risk for, boy, we're going to have some great decisions on the ground. and you will know that I'm going to be behind you, backing you up on with those decisions that you're making, and I won't be second guessing you. And when we really talk about managing risk, what is the risk that we're managing? And for me, the risk is our firefighters. They are the most important thing that we have. We ask our firefighters to do dangerous things. But those dangerous things do not have to be deadly, nor should they be. One of the important things I think you can start thinking about is, how do I look at risk? What are the things that I consider when I'm making a decision regarding risk? We need to do a better job of really looking at when to engage and when not to engage in certain situations. And that's a very difficult thing to do. And to be able to step back and to say now is the time not to engage is a hard thing to do because we are doers. We want to do things and to put that fire out. That's what we've been trained to do. That's what's expected of us. It's hard to look at our peers. It's hard to explain that to the public when you don't engage a fire. But sometimes that risk is too great for us. There's no reason for us to have a firefighter fatality. There's no reason to have a firefighter sustain a serious injury. Discussions about risk, when we start putting it on the forefront and we start making it a deliberate process, we'll start rolling through in terms of just a behavioral practice that we continue to implement. We need to be very smart and very effective with the choices that we're making. And the only way to really change the outcome of where we're at with our safety culture is by the actions that our firefighters take on the ground. And those actions always need to err on the side of safety. Learning organizations, and the fire organization is one of those, 
really work on themselves to improve. And that's what this is about. It's about taking that one more step and improving and moving things along. And so as a learning organization, I think this is perfect to get us to the place we want to be.